It's time for Washington Fish Quest. This episode, Puget Sound King Salmon Jigging. Hey Washington Fish Questers, Blake here. Well, if you follow my channel, you know I busted both of my cameras by dropping them in salt water. I now have uh, bought in a new one, a little handy cam and an old used one. And then uh, DJI, who is my more expensive camera, lived up to their warranty, their drop warranty, so uh, credit to that company. And uh, if you ever get one of those cameras, I'd say get that warranty <laughs> if you're going to be using it around salt water. Uh, so at any rate, I did take out the, the one camera I had left is I have these little knockoff GoPro cameras. I can't remember what they're called, but I'll put the name here. They don't have great audio. Uh, but I took it out with me. I went out Wednesday and Friday to uh, go salmon fishing and uh, I was jigging and both times I did get into a king So I'm going to show you that footage now uh, But this also just leads me to, to talk about when I think jigging is appropriate over downrigger fishing now If you're not from the region uh, Downriggers are the main way people in Puget Sound catch king salmon and, and most salmon uh, So what a downrigger is is basically like a crank system that has a big lead ball on it and then it has a, a, a Called a release clip coming off the back usually at the end of about a foot of kind of like plastic line and uh, It's just kind of like a clothes hanger like a clothespin and so you put your fishing line through it that way when the, and Then you can lower your gear to any depth and troll and then you have a thing called a flasher or a dodger that attracts the fish from great distances to come check out your bait. So, you know, then the, the theoretically the salmon hits or releases it from the clip or you have to just jerk it out and uh, fights on. However, in my opinion, it's not the most enjoyable way to fish because you have that flasher or dodger between you and the salmon. There's also lots of seaweed and jellyfish in Puget Sound and depending when you're fishing and where you're fishing, it can be uh, just unpractical. Uh, the jig, you, you know, it's just you and the fish. Uh, it can be tough with a clip to barb, but um, when you see these videos, I'll show you how to get around that. So at any rate, here's five, five times, in my opinion, when it's better to jig fish for kings than troll for them. I'm going to say number it with dime riggers. So number one, I would say uh, in skinny water. So I, I, see, I was out trolling on Wednesday, and you know, like I said, I got into a king. I don't think I saw anybody else. In my opinion, when you're dragging an 11-inch flasher or dodger through like 35 feet of water, it's just too big of a setup. So at the very least, if you're using a downrigger, I'd say downgrade to at least like an 8-inch flasher. You know, maybe some smaller baits because uh, if the water's clear, if there's like 20 foot of visibility, it's just, I think, too much for most salmon unless they're really aggressive. So I'd say it's number one and skinny water can pay off to jig. It's a much more natural presentation. Uh, number two, kind of on that same uh, note, but not necessarily because the water is skinny, when the fish are spooky. So uh, kind of the same thing. It, the presentation could just be too big. Some if fish are sort of mulling around, like let's say they're staging in front of a river. Sometimes they just don't want a giant flasher running right by them, and then you know a, a big spoon or something or a hoochie. It's just a bit much for them. And when they're feeding, that's great. That's the way to go. But if they're not, if they're just kind of mulling around, then I would also say that presentation could be a little too big. Uh, number three. I would say if you simply don't have the gear. So uh, you can get out and king, kingfish in, in Puget Sound, no problem. Uh, you know, uh, downriggers do catch the most fish, but don't let that hold you back if you either can't afford it or you're off a kayak or a smaller boat. You know, I catch uh, salmon off of my little nine foot dinghy, and that has no downriggers or any even electronics off of it. So you can get out there and do it if you, if you explore the area and know it well. And I would say number four, and this may be the main time is if fish are uh, st are stacked up so they are concentrated in an area for some reason I've had people comment to me when I'm at CQ uh, like I'll I'll be trolling for blackmouth let's say and I'll mark a fish you know and I'll catch it or it'll be a drive by or whatever but if I get hit I'll mark it and I'll be controlling again and I'll mark again and if I get like three marks right in the same area sometimes I'll just pull up my gear my downrigger gear and I'll just st uh, sit there and start jigging because uh, they're there and there's no reason to like basically troll your way outside of their lane uh and uh, yeah people have mentioned that when i come in they're like were you going in circles and i'm like yeah i was jigging <laughs> it was the only way i could stay on the stay on the fish uh then the fifth way which i mentioned well there we go fifth dang it fifth there we go that i mentioned uh, earlier was uh if it's just too seaweedy or jellyfishy i mean nisqually is one of my home fisheries nisqually delta and often you'll go out there i'd say this year every time i went out there and it's just not tenable to fish with a downrigger i mean you'll you'll go two minutes before your gear's just covered in slime or or uh seaweed so in that case with jigging i mean you, you can tell when you get something on it you can clean it off and you're not going to be running through everything so i'd say those are the five times and jigging pays off i'm going to show you my setup 
uh, but I'm going to do it after I play you these two videos because I know this intro has already been terribly long. So I'm going to play you these two videos. The first one I'm going to use commentary on because uh, the audio of my camera was in a waterproof case so you really can't hear anything. The second one, there is some original audio, so I'll probably just play you the original audio. Then come on back and I'll show you what I'm using for my setup, uh, you know, my, my line, my rod, my reel, and my jig. This was last Wednesday, I think August 11th that was. So I'm actually out casting for pinks and I had to be in to work by nine. So I didn't have long to be in the water. I was, you know, I launched uh, by six, but still I was only left with maybe two hours of actual fishing. To my chagrin, the pink were not there. So I figured on the way in, might as well stop at a spot I know that King can congregate at and jig for him. So this is about seven minutes into my jigging here. I just have my pink rod, so I don't have my actual jig set up, but I had a, a two ounce jig sitting in the boat. So I figured I'd give it a shot. Boom! Now, see how see there how I stood up? You know, that wasn't as fast as I usually like to do, but that is by design. So, you know, in Puget Sound, you have to clip your barbs. If you, uh, if you are jigging and you hook a king, you either need to, like, pretty much whip that pull above your head. Look how fast it came up. Yeah, it was foolish that I even grabbed the net, but that's something that can happen. So I was going to say, getting back to standing up, it's going to jump here soon, too. It was a sweet fight, and this was in 38 feet of water, so that's why it's uh, such a uh, vertical, or I'm sorry, not vertical, it's a horizontal fight. Watch, here it comes, it's going to jump, it's going to jump. Yeah, oh boy, that, you know, every time it does that, you're just, your heart skips a beat. But uh, it's a horizontal fight, because it's only 38 feet deep of water, so you got to keep the pressure on them. So I jerk, I stand up to keep the pressure on, that's why I usually jig setting down, then I stand up, and then... Uh, it, sometimes it'll just rock it right up. So that one did that. It just came right up to the boat and keeping the pressure on you basically uh, They could jump like that. It's a little easier if you hook them a little deeper like let's say 70 80 feet uh, Then you can bury your rod or they'll try to jump it at an angle and you can control them a little better Now my pull might look pretty wacky in this fight because it's going at all different angles and that is again because it's a horizontal fight oh, So there I had a shot it just wasn't ready, so I didn't pursue it. I noticed the jig is hanging out of its lower lip barely. Like, I can see, the, you know, it's like right at the tip of the jaw. So I, I know my next shot at this fish it was probably my last shot at it. Uh, and again, you can see my right angle there. And that's just countering whichever way that king's going. Because it's not just up and down. It's right, left, and, every, you know, northwest, southeast. So here we go. Um, I should warn you now that this uh, doesn't end well. Oh, the suspense. So I see, I put my my hand up on the rod so I can actually get to it because it's a long noodle rod. Haha, -ha, when I say it didn't end well, I mean it didn't end well for the king. <laughs> so you can see I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, I thought for sure I was going to lose that king. That is a great day. Uh, you know, I was pretty insufferable at work that day. Uh, <laughs> just because I had to run into work pretty shortly after this. I jigged for 20 minutes, didn't get anything else. But uh, woof, what a day, what a day. That was wonderful. So this next footage is from... Uh, Mon oh, no, so this next footage is from Friday, two days later, didn't fish Thursday. Uh, Shingo and Levi and I were out. Uh, so you can actually hear some bow cam footage here, so I'm just going to shut up and uh, let, the, let the audio do itself justice. Perfect. Uh, nice put that right there. <laughs> Made for it. Yep. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. Go ahead, Andrew. Like, we're off this side. We're good. I'll make sure that, you know. I'll make sure that you yarded off, like, the... As long as you, as long as you, uh, put his, put his line. Nice. That was definitely a school though. So, 60 was the spot.
In the bottom of the jaw again. Yeah. Here, in case the film is actually picking up. Yeah. That's right. Uh, it's I mean. Yeah. Look at that. Hey, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that. So here's my uh, rod and reel setup. So. I prefer, and this was in the second video there, uh, I like to use a nice level wind reel. This is a Abu Garcia Ambassador. In my opinion, it's probably like the cheapest of the higher end level winds, if that makes sense. You know, it's uh, kind of like the entry, entry level, like, nice reel. <laughs> and then I got a, uh, uh, this is just an ugly stick. So this is a one piece, uh, light medium action ugly stick at seven feet. I like that because often I'm jigging by myself and that way unlike in the first video I can easily net the fish uh, versus uh, you know using like a nine foot noodle rod and having a really hard time with that. I really like the one piece too. It really makes it kind of a bulldog in a fight. That rod can be completely just bent over. Uh, the two piece in my opinion is a little more prone to, to you know being stressed out. Uh, for my line and I, t I, I think I go a lot lighter than a lot of people. Um, and there's two reasons for that, and one of them is probably unfounded. But so I, I got 20 pound braid on this. In that first video, I was using 15 pound braid, uh, but I got 20 pound braid mainline. And then for my leader on this, I only have 12. I'm going to recommend to you though to use 15. If you get into a big fish, you'll never forgive me. <laughs> if you get into that 20 pound king, and it destroys your braid. But with 15, you've got a fighting chance. And most of these fisheries, even if it's shallow, there's nothing they can really break you off on. The biggest thing you got to look out for is other boats. Uh, so you know, let them run. Uh, they might jump, especially if it's really th skinny water like that first fish. But uh, that's that's what I'd, I'd recommend: 20 pound braid, uh, 15 pound mono going down to your jig, and only about maybe. Five feet a liter going down to the jig, man, maybe six, five or six feet of, of mono liter. That'll give it the stretch that they need if they do jump, but the braid will make your hook set just be uh, really, really strong because there's just no stretch there. Oh, and I forgot. Yeah, so the, the, the two reasons are, I, I don't know if they see the line or not. I do tend to do better with a thinner mono, so I do try to go as skinny as I can. I know in some fisheries they don't care. I've heard like in the Columbia River they don't care. Uh, in Puget Sound when they're a little more spooky, I kind of think they do, but I could be alone on that. And then with the braid, the reason it's like 20 pounds instead of like 50 is when you start getting moved by the current, you can fish longer with a, with a lighter jig if you have uh, basically less of a thicker line. You know, thinner line, the better. Your, your jig will be truer and straighter to the bottom. Let's see here. Then let me show you the jig I've been using. So the jig that caught both of those fish was a... How is this? Punching holes in my roof there with the rod <laughs> is this uh, P-line minnow, two ounce P-line minnow. Uh, two reasons, and I'll say three reasons. I like the P-lines is I really like the holographic uh, kind of shine to them there, uh, and then they they, are, they really look like a herring. So I use plenty of Point Wilson darts, and my friend Zach to gifted me some lures, and they're all great. Uh, I like the thick body of this P-line, just the shape of it. It really looks like a herring. Uh, and don't get me wrong, you can make your own herring jigs, or you can. Uh, you can get a Point Wilson dart in a herring shape, but for whatever reason, I really like the, the P-line uh, shape. Then the third thing is just how it flutters. It's a lighter jig for its size, and its midsections almost feels like it's spooned out. So it's a really elegant flutter, and the salmon are going to bite it on the drop. Both of those salmons, I, I basically gave them lip rings on their lower lip. Uh, the first one was barely hooked. The second one wasn't going anywhere. You probably saw Levi taking a picture there as I faded out, and that was because uh, we just wanted to get a shot of how that hook just punched through its bottom jaw. Uh, so even with the barbless hook there, that fish was going nowhere. So I could have played that thing until exhaustion, uh, unlike the first fish, which was barely, barely hooked. So at any rate, that's my setup. Uh, now that I got my cameras back, maybe I'll do a little more comprehensive jigging 101 here in the future because there is at least... Oh, five ways I'm thinking of that, that you can rig up a jig differently. And, you know, a lot of people have strong opinions on that. Um, I'm not going to cover that in this video, though, because I don't have the jigs rigged up to show you what I'm talking about. So thank you so much, and see you next time on Washington Fish Quest.